Today's class graciously sponsored by the Afsi Oni, Le'ilui Nishmat, his beloved father, Shimon ben Malka, alav shalom, that today is the Askara. Also today's class graciously sponsored by Mr. Victor Mizrahi Cohen from Mexico, Le'ilui Nishmat, his beloved father, Eliyahu ben Lela, alav shalom. Additionally, today's class dedicated Le'ilui Nishmat, Ora Devora Batrifka, in a song that to the words of Torah, her neshama have an aliyah in Gan Eden. Amen. Today's Gemara discusses very interesting messages about rabbis participating in parties, in events, parties, celebrations. So the Gemara begins the concept of Seudat Irusi. In English that means engagement. Can a rabbi attend an engagement or not? You may say, what's a big deal? If you invite me to your son's engagement, Be'ezat Hashem, I'll be there. I'm not going to say, no, I'm too busy learning, I'm not coming. But we need to understand that in the time of the Talmud, things were a bit different. Today, in our days, in our generation, depends on the community. For example, in South America, it's very common that before the wedding, they make like the civil, like the civil ceremony, right? And usually the rabbi comes, says a few words of Torah, and takes a commitment from the groom and the bride that they are going to show up for the chuppah. In the Ashkenazic world, this is done with more formalities by the name of Tenaim. Tenaim means conditions. In the Sephardic world, we don't have such a thing of doing a document of conditions. In the Ashkenazic world, in many communities, there is such a thing. So a rabbi can go to an engagement, especially if he's going to give words of hizuk to the groom and to the bride. The Gemara goes even further. But let's say there is no Seuda Mizvah. En Talmid Hakam Rashai Lehanot Mimena. A rabbi cannot go to such an event. Now, I may be a bit different than many rabbis. Wherever I go, I usually try to add the spiritual element to the Seuda. In other words, if you want to do a Hanukkah Tabai, for example, right? Guaranteed that I'm going to come with the books of Hanukkah Tabai. And we're going to say a few words. And we're going to explain what it is. That's called Sa'uda Mizvah. If we're going to go to read the Zohar, the night before of the Benit Milah, before reading it, or during the reading, we'll explain what's really going on. So, the question is, what is it called a Sa'uda that is not Mizvah? So far, every Sa'uda that I mentioned, Benit Milah, Pidyon Ben, Bar Mitzvah, Wedding, Engagement, it has a connotation of a Mizvah. What Sa'uda is not called a Mizvah? You ready for the answer? Scary. You ready? Huh? Yeah, but which type of wedding? Listen with the Gemara. And I'm not even talking about without Mechitza. We're not there. Forget about it. I know. I know that's your question. But the Gemara says, even with the Mechitza, it's questionable if a rabbi can attend such a wedding. Listen to the Gemara. 
doesn't mean that we do this today. It's important to know that the level of Bene Israel in the time of the Talmud was a bit different than what it is today. We collectively have a lot of advantages compared to the time of the Talmud, which we go back 1800 years ago. Many advantages. Number one advantage, technology. That's it. Availability of Torah classes. There was a time in history that if you wanted to learn Torah, you needed to travel. You needed to travel. So comes the Gemara and it says, two cases, Bat Kohen Le Israel, if a daughter of a Kohen marries an Israel, Ubat Talmid Hacham Le Am Haaris, and a daughter of a Talmid Hacham marries a simple person. Now the question is, what's the problem that a daughter of a Kohen marries an Israel? Is it a problem? Okay, the Gemara doesn't agree with that. En zivugam ole yafe. The Gemara explains. I said before what I said, and I'm going to say it again. If anyone is married to the daughter of a Kohen, you need to know some halachot for that marriage. Arfo, arfo. If they didn't tell you this, ask for your money back. I know, Baruch Hashem, and God bless you. You're a fortunate one. Now, the question is, why if a daughter of a Kohen marries an Israel, it's a problem. Halachically, it's not a problem. But I will tell you some guidelines. Number one, we know that a husband must respect his wife. It's not negotiation in this matter. The husband, the Torah writes, Besima hetishto. Husband's responsibility through marriage is to make sure that the wife is a happy person. You cause the happiness. You know, somebody told me the other day, my wife is not happy. Maybe you can help her. I said, I can help her if I help you. So what are you saying, Rabbi? She has the problem. I said, no, Rahim. She doesn't have the problem. She's only reflecting what you are not providing for her. Which is what? Simha. Se pasuk in the Torah. Besima etishto. But if you marry the daughter of a Kohen, then you have another obligation to honor the Kohen. Honoring your wife is a mandatory requirement. We agree on that, Professor? Yes? Chazak. Now your wife has an extra need. She's a descendant of Aharon a Kohen. So if God forbid the husband doesn't honor his wife that is a Kohen, he's doing two Averot. One for not honoring his wife, and two for not honoring a descendant of the Kohanim. But there is a formula. The Allah brings it down. Hacham of Yosef talks about it. And I've seen it in action in Argentina many years back. Someone that may be here, and if he's around, I'll ask him to tell us his story. When he came to get married, he came to the rabbi of the congregation, and he says, Rabbi, Mabruk, I'm about to get engaged with this girl, daughter of a Kohen. And the rabbi wasn't too excited about it. 
And he noticed it. He says, Hacham, you know the family, all kosher. He says, I know that it's all kosher, but I'm not sure if you're ready to marry the daughter of a Kohen. He says, why not, Hacham? I know her from high school. Good girl, kosher. It says, true. But for you to catch up to her spiritual level, because she's the daughter of a Kohen, you need to invest in your neshama. What do you mean, investing in your neshama? Doesn't everyone invest in the neshama? Are you investing? You are investing. At this moment, we are all investing in the neshama. True, he says. But if you marry the daughter of a Kohen, you need to give a, a bigger down payment. What do you mean a bigger down payment? I'm not buying a house. It says you need to give a bigger down payment to your neshama. Okay, well, how do I do? What do I do? How much sedaka I have to give? It says, no, give more. So what do I need to do? It says you need to make sure to learn Torah every day. And that's a lacha lemaaseh. Learning Torah every day helps the husband to maintain the healthy relationship with his wife, the daughter of a Kohen. And even though may say, Rabbi, I know so many people marry the daughter of a Kohanim, ta, ta, ta. I know that answer. But I'm not judging that forbid anyone. I'm only telling us the Gemara says Israel is married to the daughter of a Kohen. Maybe you should not go to that wedding. Forget about the Mechitzah question. For sure it had Mechitzah. Probably they had two separate rooms. Like a new square. I went once to a wedding many years back in Monsi. Right? And guess what? Separate halls. For men and for ladies. And in the men's there were only male waiters and male photographers. And in the ladies, I don't think there were photographers, but a lady with a photographer and ladies waiters to avoid any issue of modesty, etc. Comes the Gemara and it says, Ubat Kohen Kitihiele Ish Zar. The Torah speaks about this marriage, that the moment that the daughter of a Kohen marries an Israel, she loses the right of Terumah. Terumah is one of the gifts that the people give to the Kohen. Let's say you collected from your field a hundred pounds of wheat, before you take a grain, two percent, right? to the Kohen, 10% to the Levi, another 10% or to the needy or needs to be redeemed to be eaten in Yerushalayim. From the get-go, 22% tax gets out. Then you have a couple of more deductions. Okay, but what happens? All the time that she was single, under the tutelage of her father, she was able to eat teruma without any problem. Now, she married a non-Kohen, she can no longer eat the teruma. Why not? Because once marriage took place, the Basuk writes in Bereshit, Bedabak Beishto. The husband and wife relationship becomes a single entity. I like to say the following. Today, already for many centuries, there is no prohibition for a Kohen, a Kohen daughter to marry an Israel. But the Alakha does encourage that this Israel should invest in Torah learning a few minutes every day. If he's already doing it, great. And if he's not doing it, Yes, and by the way, going back to the story in Argentina that happened 
30, 35 years ago, the rabbi said, I'm willing to marry you with one condition, that you're going to learn Torah every day. Because if he doesn't learn the Torah daily, the Kedushah that she comes with overwhelms the lack of Kedushah that he doesn't have. You follow me? A Kohen automatically comes VIP. It doesn't matter who she or who he is. You're a Kohen, Bekidashto. You come automatic upgrade. Oh, Mr. Cohen, for sure. Mr. Gindi, for sure. You fly first class only. Why? Because you were selected by Yeshem. Comes the Gemara. Now you're going to love this Gemara for those that are listening. How do say Sheit Asher? Yedabek Bezar'o Shel Aharon. You want to be successful in business? Marry a descendant of Aharon a Kohen. Or do business with a Kohen. So exactly, it's two opinions. One is Rabbi Yohanan, and this is actually Rabbi Yohanan. It says as follows, that the zehut of the Torah learning from the husband and the zehut of the kehuna from the wife activates Osher. I, I can give you the Aleph too. Aleph is more challenging than I. Osher, Osher means Happiness. that you feel more than happy. You feel, you know, like Meushar. You are content with your life. Okay? Osher means financially wealthy. Let's clarify that not everyone that is wealthy is happy. Because happiness comes from within the person. You cannot buy happiness. You can buy comfort. You can buy luxury. Right? Happiness you can buy. You know how many times people have money and they don't live happy lives? Has shalom. Comes the Gemara and it says, what about the contradiction? Like, you ask, can be talmid hacham, can be anha'ares. Says, if the person that marries the daughter of a Kohen is someone that, the Gemara uses the language talmid hacham. <clears throat> For our days, we're going to use a different term. A Yehudi that lives a Jewish way of life. Kasher, Taharat HaMishpacha, Shabbat, Tefillah, Tefillin, supporting Torah learning, and learning Torah. Consider yourself very fortunate if you do all of the above. The opposite, the challenge is Am Ha'aris. What's the meaning of the word Am Ha'aris in English? Ignorance. Yani someone who doesn't do nothing. Maybe the person prays, it's kasher, but no more than that. Shabbat is very weak, Torah learning non-existent, etc. Comes the Gemara and it brings different scenarios concerning the concept of a uh, food. Also going back to the rabbis. And it says that rabbis need to be very careful where they go to. And I brought you a few examples. All the examples that I mentioned before, there is a connotation of a mitzvah. But let's say you're going to invite me to go to your home to watch the Super Bowl. And you say, Rabbi, all Halak Bet Yosef, Minha, Arvit, and you give a Shi'ur in the, it's called it the half time, right? Right? 
if you invite them for the Sabbath call, there is what to think. Argentina, Brazil playing, some halokhet if you can go. But on a more serious note, that's called the shoot. Nothing will happen if I don't go to watch the Super Bowl in your home. I'm not the best candidate for that because I don't know the halachot of the Super Bowl. I know halachot of soccer, baseball, basketball a bit, Super Bowl. I don't know because I never heard of Super Bowl till I came to America. Okay? I don't know all these halachot. I just know the couple of guys eating, killing each other, you know, with bruises and helmets, and they, they, they fumble and whatever it is. But the Gemara writes, and it says, this is not an environment that a Talmud Hacham or a rabbi should be at. But you'd be surprised that in America today, many schools, they offer and I agree with it, a special program for Super Bowl Sunday. Why? Because the yeshiva or the school doesn't want just the kids to be by themselves and watch whatever the halftime is called, right? Shows are, which usually are not kosher. We agree on that? So what they do, they send a rabbi to the game to watch it with the boys, right? And the boys just having the presence of the teacher there, they're gonna be calm. And the rabbi makes sure that there is minhan arvit, number one. The rabbi makes sure that when the halftime comes, they shut down the TV, and the rabbi tells them a story, give them a short class, etc. You know, different tactics, they need to be utilized depending on the generation that a person lives. Many yeshivot will never do such a thing that I'm just saying. But believe me, that there are many yeshivot that they have to do it. Depends on the location. Depends on the spiritual level of the students, of the institutions. And sometimes, you know, as I said a few weeks ago in one of the classes, today we have Two levels of Kiruv. Kiruv means outreach. You have outreach and in-house outreach. In-house, in Hebrew they call it Kiruv Rehokim or Kiruv Kerovim. Kiruv Rehokim means you deal with the outside. Kiruv Kerovim, you deal within us. That's exactly what's going on upstairs now. What's going on upstairs now in the library for the teens, this is Kiruv Kerovim, because they have no school. They have no structure. And many don't want to go to overnight camps in New York or in Canada, like many other places do. So the synagogue feels an obligation of give them a certain type of structure for them to have a meaningful and a calm summer. <laughs> summer is beautiful in many areas, but educationally and spiritually for a teenager could be a recipe for disaster. You agree? Hazard. And that's why we invest so much on that. If it's Shabbat, if it's a tree, if it's a mini camp, if it's a sacred or Mosai Shabbat, why do we do all these things? You, you think that the dear Rabbi Moshe, who deals with them, doesn't want to stay home and, and rest at home after a mega Shabbat? You have to understand, dealing with the teens is like you have 20 new kids, 20 new sons, right? And some of them need a lot of attention because parents don't give attention. And that's another problem that we find in our generation. But why do we do it? One answer, Kiruv Kerovim. We need to keep the flame alive. Whatever 
they invested through the year of education in the schools, we need to give like an, an ICU treatment to keep the patient alive, right? <laughs> I don't want to sound so dramatic, but this is what our hachamim tells us. Summer programming for the kids is mandatory. It's not luxury. Maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago, life was simpler, less complicated. Our pastime was, let's play ball, let's play with cards, and stop. Today, with the technology and the, the freedom that teens today have compared to 20, 30 years ago, God forbid, it can be Pikuwa Hefesh. Now, the Gemara goes further, and we'll finish with the following. Le'olam, another strong statement from the Gemara. And we need to understand, even though they may sound strong, but it's all Leshem Shamaim to open up our eyes. And I will explain it, but I'd like to give you the official version, and then I add my own recipe. Leshem Shamayim as well. Le'olam, im kol adam kol ma sheyesh lo, be'isa bat talmid hachab. Sell whatever you have, and marry a daughter of a good family. Why? She'imet o gole, muftah lo, she'banav talmidei hachamim. Plain explanation. The Gemara says the following. Let's be honest. And although we don't have ladies in this room, but we have ladies listening and watching in the virtual audience. Everyone agrees that the wife is the foundation of the home. Correct? The Pasuk, Halel, Eshet Ha'il Mim Sarah, Akel et Abayit, Ema Banim Semecha, David HaMelech says this in the book of Tehillim in the Halel, the wife is the backbone of the home. Even though that the husband may be the provider, but the backbone of the home is the wife. So the Gemara says, if the wife comes from a good family, a family where Torah and traditions were part of her life in a beautiful way, that's excellent. So if God forbid, God forbid, God forbid, the husband has an early departure from the world, she has her family has a backup to provide the parental presence that God forbid the father can no longer deliver because he's not among the living. I'm sorry to go to an extreme case, but that's exactly what the Gemara is saying. It says when you marry your wife, it's not only you marrying your wife. Oh, you saw a lady, you like her, she looks attractive to you, she seems good person, Mazel tov. You got to think ahead. 20 years later, parents, how many times we deal with these questions? And people ask, do you know the parents? Sometimes I say, yes, of course. I know them well. Good people, healthy people, good name. Or sometimes I have to say no. I only know the person. I don't know, I don't even know how the parents look like. It requires further research. Why parenting or the parents or the groom and the bride require research? And I'm not even talking about if they are Jewish or not. That's a given. It's for the Gemara of today. What kind of influence they will give to their grandchildren in the event, God forbid, that the father has an early departure from the world. 
you may say, Rabbi, do we need to reach to such an extreme? According to the Gemara, yes. Why? Because if the children don't follow in the footsteps of the parents or grandparents, so what did you do with your life? You came to the world, you produce a couple of children, and what's next? Heavy. And the answer is, oh, if that's the case, I'm not going to have children. That's not the answer. God forbid. If you think that way, don't get married. Hasve shalom. The idea is not to discourage marriage or parenting. Although society today is against childbirth, God forbid. But we're not talking about the Goisha world. We're talking about who we are. So the Gemara is telling us, if we read between the, la the lines, marriage is a package, is a bundle. The wife or the husband, let's clarify. Even though the Gemara in certain areas sent, made the, gave the impression uh, of appointing to the wife a lad, but on the husband's side, also is important. That he has a good background, good people, a Shem Tov, a Shem Tov, a good reputation. The Gemara brings more scenarios, but I think that we covered the basic concept of the Gemara of today. We're not here, God forbid, to cancel marriages or to cancel engagements, or to stop dating. The opposite. Whatever you are married, preserve your marriage. You're getting engaged. Besimantom. Somebody offer you a shidduch. Baruch Hashem, go out. But the Gemara is opening up our eyes. And maybe it's not necessary for us, because we are in a stage, Baruch Hashem, that we may have passed those days, but we all have children and grandchildren. And who doesn't want the success of the future generations? That's our investment. Ele toledot. Benebanim adehem kebanim, the Gemara says. Your grandchild is your son. Because your grandchild is being raised by your son. I think the message is beautiful. The Gemara, this came from actually Masechet Pesachim. Pesachim, yes. Now, the Zohar of today will go very short few points, discusses one of the most important parts of the human body, the heart of the person. Heart. The Mishnah in Pirkei Avot discusses uh, five students, I believe, of Rabbi Yohanan. And he asked them, tell me something good about life. One said, Haber Tov, be a good friend. Shachen Tov, be a good neighbor. Ayn Tova, have a bountiful, pleasant eye. Another one says, be able to forecast the future. And the fifth one, left of a good heart. Now, all of them to me sounds good. All of them, right? You agree. Which one is on top of the list? The Mishnah says, left of the good heart. Why? Because the good heart is coming from within the person. Yes, each one of these examples of the Mishnah also needs to come. But who is in the driver's seat of who the person truly is? The Mishnah writes, the Lev, Shemisham Yotzim, Kol Hamidot Atobot Shel Ha'adam. All the good character traits. If you have a good heart, you're a good friend. If you have a good heart, you're a good neighbor. 
If you have a good heart, you see things in a positive and whatever else examples brings the Mishnah. And it says, for that reason, the Zohar Kadosh writes, and it says, the heart is stationed in the middle of the body, in the middle of the torso. And the heart gives the orders. And sometimes the heart and the brain, they don't see eye to eye. It's actually an argument. Who runs the show? The heart or the brain? Sometimes the heart, sometimes the brain. The person needs to separate both. Because not every decision that the heart wants to take, it makes sense. Because the heart has one channel, it's called the emotional channel. The emotions. <clears throat> the brain has to do with the mahashava, with the intellect of the person. That's why King David says in the book of Psalms, the book of Tehillim, Lev tahor berali elokim, beruach nachon, beruach nachon hadesh bekirvi. A pure heart God created within me and allowed the proper spirit to dwell in it. But according to the Gemara, the neshama dwells in the brain of the person. For that reason, the brain is on top of the head. Is the coach of the spiritual aspect of life. The Zohar Kadosh explains, She'akol talui bo. If the heart functions, the body functions. If the brain functions, the body functions. Sometimes the brain doesn't work. Has shalom, God forbid. But the heart works. And that's why there is a debate between halakha and the field of medicine. If the brain doesn't work, is the person considered alive or not? From Torah, halakha, alive. Because the heart is alive. From medicine, no. God forbid. Although that's not the main uh, concept, but this is some of the things that the Zohar Kadosh explains in the relationship between the brain and the heart. And in a way, says the Zohar Kadosh, that the heart of the Jew is the Beta Mikdash. And the heart of the Beta Mikdash is the Kodesh HaKodashim. The Holy of Holies. The Zohar Kadosh says, if the heart of the Jew is the Holy of Holies, your heart, our heart, is the miniature Holy of Holies. And therefore, keep the heart healthy. And I don't mean only physically, obviously. I mean spiritually as well by putting good, th good thoughts, good attitude, good behavior, good actions, all that creates a direct benefit between the brain of the person and the heart of the person. One more message. Don't throw in the towel when you're reaching retirement. I know you're not doing that, right? But that's what the Musar of today says. Say sometimes people say, you know what? I work so hard. I did so many misvot. I'm retiring. I'm collecting social security. Okay? Hajj. Says the Musar of today. No. It says, keep going. You the Duracell battery. Keep going. Keep going and going and going and going and going. Until Mashiach comes. It says, but also, not only keep going <coughs> in the keep going of doing, but also take advantage to do Teshuvah. Be ready. We don't have to go further on that. There is more what to say, but for today, I think 
that we cover a lot of ground, Baruch Hashem, and we wish everybody to have a Shavuot Tov Mevorat. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Baruch Adonai Le'aholem. Amen, be amen. Rabbi Hananiah Menachashia Omer, Ratzah Kadosh Baruch Hu, Lezakot et Yisrael.